I am joined by Dr. Andrew, since he's in South Africa, allow me to introduce him first. <laughs> uh, we're joined by Dr. Andrew Mulua, who is the Director of Medical Services, and he joins us uh, from South Africa virtually. We have uh, Dr. Samuel uh, Kinyanjiri, and uh, he is Country Program Director, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. We have Joshua Gitonga, who's seated next to him, who is, the who is a, a part of the National Syndemic Disease Control Council. He will explain to us what exactly he does there. But Monitoring and evaluation, if I read correctly. True. True? Yes. All right. And we have Esther Mbao in studio as well. And uh, she's a counseling psychologist. Keep a pill. Wellness. Good to have you, Esther, in studio as well. Thank we you. are expecting Celine Akini, and she is from Positive Young Women Voices. Now, what are we discussing this morning? This is what we're discussing. We're asking the question, is there a HIV resurgence? Teens, young adults at risk amidst commodity shortage. And I cite a report. What report am I citing? Let me pull that up. Here we go. And it's the World AIDS Day report for 2022. This uh, was released by the National Syndemic Disease Control Council. For those who might not be familiar with it, uh, you, perhaps you know it better as what it was known formally, and that was the National AIDS Control Council. The name uh, evolved to the National Syndemic Diseases Control Council, and that is because they now deal with diseases beyond um, HIV and AIDS. And this is a report they released, and I'm scrolling up to get uh, to the CEO's message because she highlighted um, a couple of things. And among the things, no, actually, I was scrolling up to get to the executive uh, summary. Here we go. And among the things highlighted in this report, aside from the positives, right? So let's take a look at the positives. It says uh, key achievements in the HIV response are that Kenya has doubled the number of people diagnosed with HIV and on life-saving antiretroviral treatment from 490,000, uh, 400, uh, from 490,437 in 2012 to 1,122,334 people at the end of 2021. So that is uh, roughly a decade. All right, uh, with 73.3% of those on treatment attaining a viral suppression. Now, there is some concern that has been highlighted in this report. Despite these and other successes in the HIV program, the estimated number of new HIV infections increased by more than 2,000 cases from 32,027 in 2020 to 34,540 in 2021. This report identifies key challenges is contributing to this reversal in progress, including the clustering of new HIV infections among children, adolescents, and younger people, and the impact of commodity insecurity. Further, this report highlights the urgent need to address inequalities that reinforce injustice and promote negative health outcomes. So I will start with uh, you, uh, because this is your report, Joshua. Yeah. <laughs> so you own it? Yes. <laughs> you own it? Uh, what do you mean by this, that uh, this report identifies key challenges contributing to this reversal in progress? Are you talking about the infections increasing more than, by more than 2,000 cases in a year between uh, 2020 and uh, 2021? Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, um, one is just to give an overview, uh, if you allow me, of where we are uh, as Kenya in terms of HIV, just to form the background of the discussion that we're having. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, in Kenya, we know that we have 1.4 million people living with HIV in Kenya. And um, in 2021, uh, we estimated that around 34,540 new infections were acquired. Uh, that's quite a high number. And also, we know that also we lost about uh, 22,373 people. Now, when we think of such statistics in a country like Kenya, whether they are, where there is a health care that is quite robust, and we have ways to prevent both the new infections and also the deaths because of the treatment that we have. 
Therefore, that is what we are saying, that now we are calling everybody into action so that we can be able to address that. You've mentioned the report. Uh, this report uh, is the World Aids Day Progress Report because every year, globally, we commemorate the World Aids Day. And the purpose of that day is, number one, to ensure that we remember those we have lost along the way. And number two, we are able to sensitize uh, the population on really where we are and what we need to do. Now, this report that you referenced, which we are saying it is a race against time because we have set clear targets. The first target is by 2025. We have a whole strategic plan that uh, outlines what we need to do. The second target is the global target of 2030, which is also contained within also our, our MTP. And therefore, what uh, we've done with that report, we've come out clear to say where we are as a country and also where we need to equalize because the theme globally was equalized. Now let me come to the new infections, which is the one that you asked. Now, for the last 10 years, we've seen a great decline. From 2010, if I make reference to 2010, we were registering over 120,000 new infections per year. Now, because of the robust program, we've been able to reduce this as a country up to now what we have currently, which is 34,540. When you look at that, it's almost 66% reduction. Therefore, the program is quite doing well. Now, the issue is when we see what has happened in the last one year, between 2020 and 2021, we've seen two things that we need to pay attention to. Number one, the new infections have actually started to rise up, to increase. This is the first time in 10 years. This is the first time in 10 years. And therefore, is something that of great concern, uh, which really we have quite a number of strategies that needs to be put in place. The second thing also, the number of deaths have also started to go up from around 19,000 to 22,000. So that's why we're saying that within that one year, we've had an increase of more than 20,000 from what were registered in 2020. And also the new infections from 19 to 22, that is almost another 2,000 to 3,000 are deaths. And I think that is the bulk of it. What does the report show us? All right, and, and, and I'll ask you to hold it there. We'll, we'll get into the details. Yes. I also want to invite uh, Dr. Mulwa uh, Karibusana to the show. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think it's about 5.37 uh, where he is. <laughs> so he's clearly an early riser. Uh, Dr. Uh, what do you make of these numbers? This rise in infection, first time in 10 years. Uh, this escalation also in the number of persons who have lost their lives. Uh, Dr. Tai, I think you need to unmute your mic. Can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Tai, I think your mic is on mute, I'm being told. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll sort that out. Uh, I, I do beg your pardon for that. Uh, but uh, Esther, yes. what do you make of, of these numbers? Do they concern you? Do you think it's a fluke? Um, I think as a behavioral scientist, they are not very surprising to me, to be very honest. 2020, 2021 are very unique years for the entire world. We got into a place where we have never experienced things we've never experienced before. COVID was trauma. And what happened is it came to shake the core of who we are at our humanity. And so what happened is a lot of issues came up and they arose and it was not business as usual so even with the numbers i would also say it's not business as usual given what we have gone through in the past two years given the rise in the especially the demographic that we're experiencing i would say we didn't really give them much uh, mental health support as we should have at that point in time and hence they had to look for coping mechanisms for them to be able to wade through the trauma and for them to be able to say how do we keep on surviving? We keep saying the father of um, psychology, Freud, was very clear when he said yes. two things drive huma, human, yes. um, the human race, 
food From and sex. Percent. And so hence, sexual so health was not really regarded when, when um, COVID hit in. So oh. as a world, we lost our focus. We stopped looking at all the other emerging issues and we had to put everything aside and look at this is what we are, we are faced with. How do we first mitigate it? But then as we were trying to mitigate and bring down the COVID numbers, other numbers are also on the rise. And this is one of the results of it. So I think in the next coming years, we need to keep a very close eye in terms of what are the effects of these two years in terms of especially this Gen Z uh, generation and how it is going to affect them in the years to come. So for me, it is not really a surprise. Because it's not a surprise. No, it is All not. All right. So you're saying uh, these were unique a couple of two unique years. Two traumatic years. Two traumatic this years. This was trauma that we are all living through. And when you're going through trauma, you get into survival mode. And so when you're in survival mode, you're looking for comfort. And comfort means I'm looking for company. And as human beings, if you look for co comfort and company in the opposite um, gender, things are, are bound to happen. Also looking for comfort and company in other um, in other circles makes you go to coping mechanisms that are not very healthy. So we're not able to sit down and address and look at how do we mitigate the effects of COVID as it's happening, but as it's also affecting other areas and other, um, you know, other diseases and other things we have been trying to, to manage over the years. Okay. Yes. So uh, there's a report which was filed by Angela Kitchen, Masi Chelengat. Actually, Angela is who shared this report uh, with me on, on this uh, the World AIDS Day 2022 uh, NDCC uh, ass assessment, right? So Kenya records rise in new HIV infections in over a decade. And uh, they explain that eight out of 10 new HIV infections occur among adolescent girls and young women aged between 15 and 24. But before I, I look at uh, whether or not girls are particularly vulnerable, and uh, that is because actually there's a term they use here. I think the feminization or something, I will find it. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I look for that, perhaps uh, Dr. Mulwa, you can give us your preliminary thoughts on these numbers as released by the NDCC, NSDCC. <laughs> Can you now hear me? Perfectly. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I think my colleague has shared the numbers and uh, the worry and uh, concerns that we have as a Ministry of Health uh, in regards to first new HIV infections uh, for the first time uh, seen a 7.3% uh, growth uh, in the number of new infections. Uh, uh, also uh, increasing the number of uh, deaths but of importance is to uh, look at uh, where are we getting these new infections. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at, at, the, at the statistics, 52% uh, of the new infections are amongst uh, young people and uh, adolescents between the ages of uh, 10 and 29 years. Something that uh, is a concern to the Ministry of Health and that, what that, therefore this means is a uh, the new epidemic is being driven by younger generation, which probably have, have, have not experienced the HIV AIDS pandemic that was experienced for those of us who are older uh, than 30 years, uh, who experienced the, 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 the pandemic uh, in its ugly form in the 90s and uh, in the early 2000s. So therefore, uh, it calls for a rethinking or reimagination uh, of uh, the programming. Uh, of course, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is responsible in terms of uh, disruption of services to some extent where uh, we have not had, we had disruption of supplies of essential commodities, in, including preventive commodities like condoms in the country, uh, including uh, testing of uh, early infant diagnosis uh, for, 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 for children and even for the entire population, the test kits, we have had uh, erratic supply from the, in the, uh, the result of COVID-19 in 2021 and beginning of 2022, uh, we had disruptions. So with this multiplicity of factors, it is now upon us as government to 
align our programming to the to, to the to the current realities that we are facing. Uh, thankfully, that uh, we have been able to work on uh, some of those challenges that we have been facing as a result of COVID-19, and we have uh, restored uh, the pipeline for supply of these commodities. And we hope uh, that uh, going forward, uh, with the efforts that we are doing, like the triple threat. Uh, 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 campaign against uh, new HIV infections in young persons, uh, uh, teenage pregnancies, and gender-based violence, which are the major drivers of new infections amongst these populations, we are going to reverse uh, this trend. Indeed, uh, as a country, and uh, in the same report, I think was highlighted that uh, up to 92% of people who have HIV AIDS indeed uh, know their HIV status. We still have this uh, last mile of getting to the 8% who are HIV infected and do not know their status because these are the people who will drive the epidemic and therefore we need to identify them, uh, put them on treatment and uh, ensure that they, uh, uh, they, 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 they achieve what we call a viral load. Uh, 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 undetectable viral rod, uh, uh, virally suppressed, uh, in other words, and this will now effectively stop the epidemic as it is. So it's uh, easier said than done uh, because it will require not just the Ministry of Health but a society-wide approach because uh, uh, you've had this has everything to do with the behaviour change and therefore it is it is not just a matter of having the policies right, having the uh, the the the, the, the the, the the commodity pipeline having the the health system ready but it's more of a whole society approach thank you all right uh, dr mulwa uh, we need to take a break but when we come back we'll also hear from you dr kinyandri of uh, the aids healthcare foundation you had a you held a press briefing i believe it was on the 28th of november uh, addressing shortage of commodities more specifically condoms in your view was the shortage triggered by supply chain disruptions occasioned by the covid pandemic and i did find i did find that particular sentence i was looking for and uh, also the the data has been um, has also been ably uh, put forth by the director of medical services there and also as shared by joshua uh, eight out of ten new hiv infections occur among adolescent girls and young women aged between 15 and 24 uh, dr Tari stated that and uh, raising the burden of the feminization of the epidemic i'm also curious what joshua has to say about that uh women and girls continue to bear the brunt of the epidemic they become infected at a much earlier age than men and boys of the same age says the report it also reported and and thank you for the correction uh dr mulwa earlier i had said uh, 52 percent of all new infections occurred among uh, teens and young adults between 15 and 24 it's actually 15 and 29 years so we take a break when we come back we look at the numbers from the gender lens but also children kenya's new hiv infections are dominant among children and younger adults below the age of 34. the behavioral uh, scientist in the room says uh, this is not surprising coping mechanism covid uh, what else could be driving uh, driving up these numbers the gen z gen, he, gen z yes all right uh, Dr. Dr. Mulwa spoke about gen z yes <laughs> so we get into because when we were growing up and dr mulwa said those above 30 know of the campaigns that were there previously do you remember okay freak bila socks oh no did you my trip true how do you reach gen z <laughs> Welcome back to AM Live. And this is a question we are asking uh, this morning. Are we experiencing a HIV resurgence? Teens, young adults at risk amidst commodity shortage, according uh, to a report by the National Syndemic Disease Control Council. I think what we've been grappling with before we took the break was, is this COVID related? And therefore, is it an outlier? Are these figures outliers? And with me in studio, uh, at Virtual, joining us virtually in studio is Dr. Andrew Muloa, who is the Director of Medical Services. He is in South Africa. Uh, kindly woke up early this morning to join us. Dr. Samuel uh, Kinyandri, Country Program Director, AHS, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And a gentleman I baptized uh, when we were on break, but uh, jo uh, <laughs> Joshua Gitonga, who is the Head of Monitoring and Evaluation National Syndemic Disease Control Council. And Esther, who's laughing at me, uh, Counseling Psychologist, uh, Kipepeo uh, Wellness 
joining us in studio now. As promised, we are joined by Celine Akinyi, and she is from Positive Young Women's Voices. Karibu sana, Celine. Thank you for taking uh, the time to join us this morning. Uh, Dr. Terry, before we took the break, uh, I was curious, this shortage of commodities uh, we're talking about, and uh, that also Dr. Mulwa referenced, uh, is it on account or down to the supply chain disruptions occasioned by COVID? Um. I wish it was that simple. Uh, I don't believe it's that simple. There are many factors included here. And um, from where I sit, I think there are several things that we can outline as a cause of this shortage, and therefore treat it not as an outlier, but something substantial that we need to deal with. One, the shortage, um, I cannot discount COVID that contributed. But I think one of the main reasons why we have this shortage, now we will continue to see the disruptions, um, is because there is significant uh, reduction in funding from our partners. Mainly uh, the US government. I believe they cut down the funding uh, to the H uh, HIV response in Kenya by between 40, if my numbers are not uh, wrong between 40 and 45 percent from 2017 to what they are giving now and that's significant uh, one of the other commodities that has been affected completely removed from the budget of the u.s government are condoms completely removed if you look at their strategic plan uh, 2024 to 2030 there is not even a mention of the word condom in that strategy not a mention why is that? I'm just as curious as you are. Because when we talk HIV prevention, we know that condom is central. I remember A, B, C, C. abstain, be faithful, and condoms. Now they've knocked out the C completely out. And they replaced it with PrEP. This is a medication to get PrEP, you need some, one needs to be tested. And therefore, testing becomes a barrier to people accessing PrEP. Now, the other thing that has been affected by the reduction in funding is HIV test kits. I believe we've dropped from a high of 11 million, higher, to approximately four, 3 to 4 million. And as a result, we can't even deliver PrEP. As a result, the last two years, while well, the numbers show otherwise about uh, mothers transmitting HIV, they are newly born children, infant and children uh, who are breastfeeding. I think the reality is very far from what the numbers are showing because a significant number of mothers who are pregnant during the last two years did not access HIV testing during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And as a result, are living with children who they do not the mothers don't know their own HIV status, and the children don't know their HIV status. We know. If we miss testing them, they may not see their fifth birthday. So I think if there is anything that I'm uh, acutely concerned is about the children below the age of three in our country at this point in time. Particularly for mothers who do not know their HIV status. Those who know their HIV status have been on our doors knocking every other man saying, can my child be tested now? I've come, we take the blood from the heel of the foot, so they come for the, uh, let test your socks. And for, a long, uh, for the last two years, we've also had challenges with the same, owed to the same uh, disruption that Dr. Moodwell referred to in the testing of children. So this disruption it has something to do with the funding, has something a lot to do with the funding has something to do with the covid disruption on supply chain but the reason that funding is an issue that's what worries me more than covid was okay. because that tells us that this disruption are bound to go on as we continue now so coming to condoms we say they are central we've had disruption for the last two years and I'm aware that the government uh, and Dr. Muller did indicate that last week they distributed uh, 50 million condoms. 
they still be in the pipeline. Several places have not yet received, but 50 million condoms is what we need, Kenya needs, for a month. At best, six weeks. And this is Christmas. I think December is just special. It's a long holiday, everybody is away from duty, and we are into festivities. And if I might quote Esther, a lot of us will be seeking comfort. A lot of us will be thinking to unwind. So what does that mean? A lot of us will be doing something we all know called Vasha. We'll be headed to the coast. We'll be headed to the lake region. What happens is that there will be more activity, and if these supplies are not available, it means there will be more, uh, not only just HIV, because when you look, I look at the condom, we look at a triple shield. It prevents, averts, unwanted, un, uh, unintended pregnancies, which is something the young people, Gen Z, are more scared of pregnancy, more than HIV. That's why P2 is high on the risk, more than condoms. Number two, it also prevents sexually transmitted infections that are on the rise now. And some of us, given the, what we are seeing, we suspect there may be even uh, drug-resistant STIs in this country. And number three, the dreaded HIV infection. So the condom does more than the other method we use for HIV prevention. In fact, it can even protect you from getting other things like, uh, like um, uh, hepatitis B or blood bone. Uh, things are passed through the excretions, body excretion. Mm. The condom protects. Okay. So we are talking about the three that are salient. Okay. But there are many others. All right. And, 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 I want, and, and as I see, you really want to jump in at that point. But let's hear from Celine first. And also, uh, Dr. Mulwa, I'm curious to hear uh, what you make of what uh, Dr. Rikinyanjui is saying. Because uh, he talks about this shortage, this commodity shortage, this being about more than COVID, which is what worries him. And he's talked about the cut of donor funding. Uh, in the NSDCC report, uh, in the executive summary, I read and I read now that they say there is need for increasing domestic res resources uh, to bridge the gaps in the procurement of essential HIV commodities. And uh, the report underscores the urgent need for country ownership towards implementing high impact interventions to end HIV as a public threat. So as far as this recommendation, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to hear uh, what you have to say. But uh, first, uh, Celine, kizungwa o kisaili, kisaili ndoko saa nayo. So unafanya kazi na positive young women's voices. Hili report linonesha kwamba HIV infections katika wasitana haswa imeongezeka. Imeongezeka. Yeah, Iyo ina kusurprise ama ni kitu unexpect. Vili uko kwa ground, munafanya kazi kwa ground. Uh, Ivo do mambo hiko? Iyo ndio mambo hiko. Mm, Tukitembea unaona imeongezeka. Yani imeongezeka. So ukionda, ukienda kuuliza, ukikutana na wata hospitali. Una, una, ukisikia vile mtu anakuambia lipata HIV anakuambia tu ati vile apati pesa sasa kipata mwanaume ako na pesa itabidi tu waende na hivyo sasa nauliza mbona muwezi tumia trust ati sasa kama amenipea 5000 mbona ni tishe tena condom naona sasa tunajaribu kuambia ifai hivyo hata ukipata mtu hata kama ni shida hiyo tumia trust baada atakuelewa tu na ujue mtu naenda na yeye Bila, bila anakwambia muende na ye bila trust huh? so trust is a brand ya condom yeah tr eh, condom eh, eh. tayari akuna ugonjwa ndio maana nakwambia muende bila trust na uko bado uko mdogo uko na bado uko na maisha ingine ya kesho unaona ujaza mm. ushakuwa positive unaona sasa so, kuna wenye wanaenda tu ati sasa ni hiyo shida ndio inafanya wana jua kuna kazi mm. sasa so, inabidi tu akipatana na mtu tu anaenda Mm. So, uh, vile daktari hapa nasema, nasema, mm. ni kama e generation awa dogo, uh -huh. ni kama wanaogopa mimba kuliko HIV, kuliko ugonjwa. Yoni ukweli? Eh, hey, yes. Mimba, 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 mimba wanaogopa, lakini ugonjwa wanasema tu atakiwa nayo, atamezadawa. Uh -huh. Eh. Hey. 
the dawa ni free mm. eh so wana wanaichukua hivyo mm. yeah okay mm. so yes esther um, I, i just want to jump in and say that there are a lot of factors that we need to look at at the social level First of all the stigma that we had when we were growing up is no longer there with the Gen Z. Like she's saying for them they fear pregnancy because that's responsibility and they're thinking with HIV I'll just keep going for you know for, for the meds I'll just be a person living with HIV but I can continue living my life. That's one social factor. The other factor we need to remember is puberty is coming at an earlier onset age. As young as 9 year old girls are starting their periods. However, as a society, have we taken time to talk to our children to empower them on sexual health because we are born as sexual beings. However, from the time this child is walking, we are not teaching them the basics of sexual health and that they are sexual human beings, so we normalize the sex talk from an early age. So we need to look at very different social factors that are coming into play. I also like that you talked about the feminine factor that has come in and we also need to look at in today's age what is sexuality? There are so many changing trends that I hear even in my therapy room and I'm like oh, it's happening in this day and age. So have we awakened to the sexual trends, to the different things that are happening and that are being affected also by social media and by the pay on TV that we all have most of us have mm. in our homes and we're not bringing in all these factors and considering how do we mix all these factors and be able to look at how do we also look at bringing down these numbers and be able to address gen z in a way that communicates to them mm. yes okay so uh, uh, joshua uh, gitonga i'm coming to you head yes. monitoring and evaluation uh, national syndemic disease control council and i'll come to you to ask you this right because for a long time we were trying to destigmatize mm. yes. <laughs> hiv and aids we told people it's okay even if you have it mm. uh, there is medication you can live a long healthy life are we now going to turn it around and, 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 and strike the fear of God in Gen Z and tell them, you guys, this thing is, can kill you, you know? So what's, what's, the, what's the strategy then? Because you remember, like I had the fear of God instilled in me as far as HIV is concerned when I was growing up uh, and, and people will say I've betrayed my age, but yes, but now I don't see as many there was this, the self-testing kits. I think I saw that campaign the last, uh, but not as many campaigns as I saw growing up do I see now. And anyway, they're on Netflix and Showmax. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we reach them? Uh, but first, uh, Dr. Mulwa, I invite you to speak to the issues that were raised uh, by uh, Dr. Kinyanjui <coughs> with regard to commodities, donor funding, and what the NSDCC is recommending, which is an increase in domestic resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I, I want to first uh, associate myself with the comments of Dr. Kinyachui that uh, our HIV financing has been and is still heavily financed. Uh, Kenya has in the last five or so years uh, been classified as a middle income economy. And what therefore means to the country is that uh, uh, less and less of donor uh, financing uh, is coming to the country and therefore this uh, has, has affected our HIV uh, uh, programming. Uh, further, uh, as we approach towards uh, uh, epidemic control where we are all reaching the 90-90 uh, UNH target and now into 95-95 95 target of having 95% of the people who have HIV uh, tested and 95 of those who are tested uh, being put on, on uh, antiretroviral drugs and 95 of that uh, being virally suppressed uh, we are approaching and we have been approaching what we call epidemic control uh, what that, that, that therefore me less and less partners would be interested in, in, in investing in the hiv program in the country uh, of essence is that uh, as the partners withdraw we have uh, a huge gap in financing for HIV. I think as we speak every year, we have a financing gap of about 10 billion Kenya shillings uh, in the HIV uh, programming. Of course, there are many priorities in the country and uh, we, we have to have strategies. One, 
to make sure that every shilling is able to do more and that will require uh, a lot of efficiency gains uh, in, in our program uh, we integrate services we ensure that uh, we utilize uh, uh, digital platforms or uh, 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 digital platforms for delivery of services that will give us uh, efficiency so that uh, for every shilling we are able to achieve more uh, the issue and and this I, I like the issue of uh, the, of condoms. Of course, partners will invest where their interests are. Uh, the, our, our partners uh, feel that uh, they the country should be able and they, they not just condoms. Uh, we have other commodities, essential commodities like uh, like the uh, prophylactic drugs. Uh, for 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 comorbidities uh, uh, like optimizer, which uh, they are also not funding, uh, because they feel the country should be able to take up some of those programs, and therefore it's upon us, the government, and we have been doing that through one uh, the multilateral uh, funding, the global fund uh, funding. We have been able to buy condoms. We have been able to mobilize resources internally. I think in the last uh, two years we have seen. A tremendous increase in uh, in the financing from uh, the, the, the national coffers. Uh, I think for the first time last year, uh, we had about 1.2 billion Kenya shillings allocated to HIV programming commodities uh, from the exchequer. This was increased in the course of the year by about 1.8 billion, uh, bringing the total to about 3 billion Kenya shillings. In the current financial year, we have uh, an, an increase as well. Uh, from uh, the, the 1.2 uh, billion uh, to 2.6 billion, uh, having a drop about 5.4 billion Kenya shillings supplies from uh, the local resources. Of course, our partners have also changed uh, their conditions. That uh, even before uh, they give us the money that we are saying is reducing, they have put a precondition to the Kenya government that uh, you have to put on the table such and such amount, which uh, in essence means uh, it's time that the country starts. Uh, more, using its own resources for HIV programming. And I think we are on a trajectory, but uh, we still have huge gaps. Uh, we require uh, about 450 million uh, condoms in a year. Uh, Dr. Kinyanju mentioned that in the country, we have about 50 million uh, condoms that are under distribution. Uh, in the pipeline, we have, we have about 90 million uh, condoms uh, that are, uh, are, are due for supply. But this is just a part of the uh, annual requirements. Uh, for, for the year. So therefore, th 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 this means that uh, we also have to have very candid conversations with our young people and, and, our, and our communities, even as we think about uh, about uh, purchasing, because we may not tomorrow have all the money to buy the 450 million condoms that are required in the country in a year. What we need to do is to ensure that the vulnerable populations, the populations that can indeed are sexually active and cannot afford uh, condoms, are made to uh, are given the free condoms that we supply, but we also engage the other part of commodity that is able, of the society that is able to afford condoms, then tell them it makes more sense. And Kenyanji has put it uh, very well that uh, condoms uh, are prevent you uh, from getting STIs, they prevent you from getting unwanted pregnancies, and prevent HIV. And therefore, with that advantage, uh, we tell them uh, a condom is cheaper than P2. And a condom has more advantages than P2. So we, these are conversations that we need to to, change, to, to have. And also now the, the whole issue of behavior change uh, needs to be addressed. The one thing that I, uh, we, we concentrate, and Kinyaji has also mentioned, is the issue of uh, adolescents and young persons who are getting pregnant, uh, miss HIV testing, get HIV, uh, uh, children whose HIV status they do not know, is an issue that has been of concern. Of course, looking at the myriad of uh, challenges that uh, have already been related is an area that we have to learn from the best and if there is one thing that ministry of health uh, and other players in the hiv space we are going to work on our target is to reduce the transmission of mother to child uh, of hiv from the current 8.9 to below five percent but we feel in the next five years we should move to even below two percent because we, if we are able to close new infections among us uh, children then we will be able to have HIV-free children and an HIV-free generation. Then the rest can be done through the messaging. And, uh, uh, we have uh, been rightly uh, told that uh, we need uh, age-appropriate sex education from an early age. Uh, and sex education should be from 
uh, infancy through childhood through teenage is, is, is not something that you wait until uh, young uh, children grow to the age of teenagers and you start bombarding them with health education it is start from early and uh, that is why as a ministry we are looking at now developing the uh, sexual uh, reproductive uh, the first uh, sexual and reproductive health policy for the young persons so that uh, age appropriate health education is inculcated from an early age uh, finally as i conclude the issue the role of men in the drive of this uh, pandemic or a uh, new epidemic cannot be ignored that uh, whereas uh, and, and and the report rightly says that uh, there is feminization of the hiv infection but the reality is the man is the driver of the feminization one man and the studies have shown one man and because we are doing uh, targeted uh, testing uh, one man is able to infect up to five women uh, with the hiv and therefore that means if we are to close the tap of new infections then we have to uh, make programs that address prevention amongst men the man in our patriarchal society still remains to have a lot of say uh, in, in, in sex and, and sexual uh, behavior. And therefore, uh, we need to uh, look at men, whereas they are not uh, affected uh, as much as women by the uh, HIV pandemic, uh, they are the drivers of this pandemic. And therefore, it is very important to also engage the, the, the men in this. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I think having said that, we have uh, a lot to do as a ministry. We have to do a lot with our partners and uh, domestic resourcing because uh, Kenya should transition uh, from uh, donor uh, financing uh, by 2027. There, therefore, means that we have to deploy more domestic resources towards HIV programming. And for that to happen, we can only close the tap. All uh, right. All right, uh, Dr. I'll, I'll now. Prevent Okay, Dr. Yi, I'll, I'll stop you there so that I can also invite uh, the other panelists in the room to comment. Um, and there was a question I posed to you, uh, uh, Joshua, Joshua Gitonga, the National Syndemic Disease Control Council head, head of Evaluation and monitor, Monitoring and Evaluation. I think that's the order in which uh, yes. it appears. I asked you this question. Uh, how? Because he talked about messaging. Dr. Mulwa talked about how do we message this so that it reaches the Gen Z. Um, so, and I'll also invite you, Dr. Kinyanji, to come in uh, on that. But uh, how, my question was, how do we strike the balance between getting them to take it seriously and also not scaring them? Okay. Um, just, just to mention, let, let me start by the stigma that was there. And the point is, then do we go back there so that people are afraid? No. Because, number one, when people are stigmatized and they are afraid, they withdraw and they hide. Now that way we cannot be able to manage this response well. So one great thing that has happened is that the stigma levels have gone down, meaning that people can be able to come out and seek services and also get the help that is required. So that's one thing I want to mention. Number two, talking about the young people. I want to say that uh, young people this is a population uh, this is a, 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 a population of people of many fast experiences it's a time of many fast experiences and many transitions now why fast in every way everything is fast 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 experiences exploration and therefore we need to make sure that as they come to their fast because they are many fast you are moving from uh, primary to secondary, adolescents and young people, from secondary to the university, from the university to the labor market. Now, each of that level has many challenges. And as we say, issues of companion, issues of association. Therefore, we need to address the behavior that might be there at that point. Whether it is an adopted behavior, people want to explore, to experience. How do they experience, but when they are protecting themselves. I'm saying this because I'm looking at the two months holiday that we have. We have everybody from primary to secondary to tertiary institutions, all of them are at home and we have them for two months. 
we need to ensure that we address them and we put that messaging that really we need to take responsibility the leaders the parents and the young people themselves why because this is a time that is kind of um, uh, um, uh, um, has issue of multiple uh, sexual partnerships which uh, predisposes them more is a team a time that now the ability uh, to negotiate for safer sexual activity becomes also difficult it's a, a time for a sexual debut so these are the ones that we are talking of the first 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 how do we equip them to ensure that as they come to these fast experiences and the transitions they are having, then they are doing them while protecting themselves? I think that is what would really request everybody, whether parents, everybody who has that opportunity, just to ensure that at least we protect them those two months and we give them correct messaging without uh, thinking that they are not active. Majority are active and therefore those are active we are bound to uh, to protect them so so for me the, the two months even as we, it was said this December festivities moving meeting friends interacting gifts that are need to be given I think this is an area that we need really to protect them well and ensure that they are well important in terms of messaging so that at least they know and they become responsible as they enjoy during the holiday. Okay, and I'll ask you also to, to, to add to that, um, Esther, in terms of, um, for example, there's a question of inequality, which uh, Celine has talked about, right? These are women who, ha who are desperate yeah. and, and so resort to selling their bodies, right, yeah. at a young age. Uh, but then there's also the ones you talked about who have, are exposed to more, yes. are more open to experimenting. Yes. Uh, these are two different groups of people. So yes. are the, are the appro should the approaches for, for the two be different? So yes. we, I'll come to you uh, for that. But uh, Dr. Kinyandri... I wanted you to explain something to me. I googled condom brands in Kenya. I see Durex, uh, Kiss, Trust that uh, Celine was talking about, Shua, Erotica, Skin, uh, Iconic, uh, let me see, and then the Rough Rider uh, that many people love to talk about. Uh, so w w which ones are in shortage? Because I'm seeing these ones are available on my dawa and and other and car four and and yeah so which condoms are we talking about that there's a shortage of uh, thank you very much uh, when we talk condoms just like when we talk of uh, unga there is a, a population we're looking at high end when you can middle income we're looking at the base of the pyramid and uh, luckily for economies the base of the pyramid is usually the widest, therefore keeping everybody as stable. And the base of the pyramid in this country are the ones who consume the free for distribution condoms. Those are the ones that are out of stock, that are, uh, supplies have been uh, erratic. And interestingly, even those who are selling uh, the, 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 what we call socially marketed condom, like trust my sister talked about here, even with this shortage, they have not seen increased in sales. Because those who consume the free for distribution, 90% of them can't afford. I'm looking at the report, uh, there was a report uh, in, the new, in the news yesterday or a few days ago, claiming that um, the, the income of Kenyans has now increased mm. from a certain percent, from to 20, certain, to 20 thousand. to 20,000. Yes. That means most of the people are earning actually and if you have to budget a budget of 10,000 in this country in this city putting a house put uh, food put uh, uh, school fees and all other necessities there is really no room for the condom now aware of this we are dealing with a public uh, an, uh, disease of public interest an infection of public interest for this reason yes that's what I'm referencing to for this reason, we need, everybody need to be safe if anybody was to claim to be safe. Because while we're seated, wherever we are, we don't know who our better partner is. We do not know where our children are 
and what they are up to. So if my children are not safe, no one else's children are safe. Because this is something that is contagious from one person to the other. Dr. Mulu has ably reminded us that the man is a key driver of the infection. Because it can be all over the place. The other thing is that because of the biology, men tend to infect more and to be infected less. Because of the nature of the biology. One is entering into a house and leaving, and the other one is staying at home with the goods that were delivered. I guess, I, I, I think you understand. Mm. Now, the other thing is that while the men are less infected, another point we need to mention very clearly is that they are dying more. The deaths we are seeing are more in men than in women. Is that because they're less likely to get tested? And to, uh, and to adhere to treatment. As they travel all over the place, they don't adhere to treatment. Now, let's, let me come back to the question you asked me about condoms. So the condoms that are missing are the free for distribution. From the government, there is a sure condom. From AHF Kenya, there is Icon Gold. is our premium condom. There is Love condom. Maybe that's why it's not even being seen because for the last two years we've been unable to import because our donor has declined to pay, to bring in condoms and pay taxes. So the tax has been a barrier. And that's one of the things that I strongly believe that the government can, in a, in, in a stroke of pen, someone can just waive those con uh, taxes on free for distribution, clearly labeled from the, from the outer box, inner box, and the condom itself written clearly free for distribution, not for sale. So just waiving taxes in three months, mm -hmm. AHF Kenya can bring into the country 20 million condoms. And uh, there are several other partners who are willing to do the same, but the tax has been a barrier. Okay. That's one of our asks that I believe the government can easily move away, knowing that they have challenges with the, with the budgets, the debts, but if you look at the amount of money the government is going to get from taxes and the benefit that it would get from 20 million, 100 million, uh, I believe the partners can bring in even 100 million to augment what the government is already doing, which is 150, would be already at 250 million. Okay. That's more than halfway of the demand for the low end right. by just moving away the taxes. So I need to take a break. Uh, but when we come back, I'll also give Dr. Mulo occasion to respond to the question of taxes. Because is it ARVs which were also stuck? At the port? At the port because of I, I issues see. to do with taxation. Uh, even even the, the family planning uh, implants were stuck at the port. Mm. Last year, uh, also the UNFPA uh, supplied condom was stuck at the port for, I think, three, four months over the same issues. Mm. And therefore, the partners are, are staying away. Okay. from donating. All right, so we'll, we'll get the answer to that on the other side of that break, uh, of, of this break. And Esther, I've not forgotten the question I've asked you. And, and Celine, uh, I'll, I'll also seek to hear from you what these guys are talking about. Is that the reality uh, on the ground? We take a break. We'll be back with more. Welcome back to AM Live. Before we took the break, Dr. Kinyandri talked about income levels. You're good, all right. So this is what he was talking about. This is the uh, Daily Nation uh, from uh, yesterday. And uh, Kenya's average monthly income climbs to 20,123 uh, shillings. So you're saying for many uh, condom purchase, uh, for those, the wider population is, uh, is expensive. All right. So um, I'd like to invite Celine at this point. Celine. Mambo kwa ground juu tunasikiza na nilikuliza hii swali ulikaniambia watu ni kweli wanaogopa mimba kuliko uh, kupata HIV. So yes. ni nini tunaweza fanya? Tuna tu, tunavaa tubonge na waje. Ni vitu sasa vile tumetoka kwa ground. Tunatembea kila mahali cause positing young women wanatuitanga mahali tunakutana pale. Sasa nikishare story yangu sasa ile huyu ayuko na nini? ako HIV negative na mimi ni, niko positive za tukishare hii yetu una, una at least huyu anaona vile anaweza anaweza kaa kumeza dawa pia sio rahisi kwa wale waja meza hiyo dawa so mimi natembea di kuna hapo kwa ground kuna wasichana di wanafanya parking mimi mwenyewe najitolea kwenda usi kuchukua condoms na wapea bure naona 
you, kama wameamua ni hiyo ndio kazi wanafanya lakini nawaambia wasiende pale bila trust mta sikudangaje juu sasa una uko na pesa ulale na ye bila <coughs> bila trust sasa mimi mwenyewe ndio nawapelekeanga hata wanajua nisaidie na nisaidie na ile kisha kuambia hivyo unaelewa tu ni nini anata anataka juu nawajua wote kwa ground au wasiana sasa naenda kwa hospitali nachukua condom na waletea naenda na fea yangu na waletea hapa at least wakwe safe mali wanafanya. Okay. Yeah. Na tunafatua ongeleshe wakiwa kutoka what age? Yeah. When, yeah. when do they become sexually active? Ni nini lilini katika maisha yao wananza mambo ya ngono? Suna kuta tu kama sasa hii kuna kuna wasena hapo Shasha niko Dandora. Shasha, kuna msichana ako na 16 years. Tayari shapo positive ako na mtoto mtoto pia ako positive sasa shasha pia tunaenda kutembea anga huko juu pale ni pombe ukisha kunywa pombe umekutana na mwanaume pia amelewa mna mnafanya hiyo hiyo mapenzi hivyo bila trust unaona sasa ukienda pale tu unazalia tu machozi juu ni 15 years ashapata mimba ako positive ta HIV positive tayare amezaa mtoto pia ako positive sasa tunatembea anga kwa hizo kwa hapo kwa mtaa kuwaelezea vile wanazaishi. Mm. Yes. Esther. Uh, when should we start talking to our children about safe sex? Um, as early as you teaching them to talk, you need to start having conversations about their sexuality and sexual health. It begins with simple things and I like to give this example. How you name the body parts. You know, you name a body part, allow me to say this dudu. And the next minute I'm killing a cockroach there with a dudu. What mindset have you already created in your child about their sexuality? So we need to be very intentional as parents to just start the conversations. I'm not saying at two years you're telling them about the act or what, you know, what, what is to happen. It is to give them age appropriate information because by the age of five, you should be teaching them about boundary settings. Allow me to also be very candid and say this. The girls are also being very vulnerable because we've not taught them to say no. We've not taught them to set boundaries. We've not built in them a value system for them to first value themselves because we know uh, to an extent in terms of sexuality, there's a value that a woman derives from having engaged in sexual activity and being found attractive by the opposite sex. So just being able to lay the foundation in terms of their boundaries, in terms of value systems, and in terms of normalizing these conversations so that these children, you're able to continue to grow with them as they get to the stage of being sexually active, then you can have these very honest and candid conversations. Allow me to throw a spanner in the works. We have a condom sh shortage at this point in time. Does it mean that we now allow, you know, it's free fall? No, we look at what can we do with what we have to be able to mitigate new infections. What can we do at this point? Because I keep saying if you're breathing, you still have a chance to make amends. What can we do at this point in time with this long holiday to be able to put in measures that we can be able to take care of our young people? So conversations need to be had. And I like that she's going around having the conversations. But the parents who are watching us today, have you worked on your own sexuality then you'll be able to have these conversations with your child because i also keep saying our youth are a direct reflection of what is also happening to the older generation allow me to be honest and say that it's just that they are not empowered enough to put in the measures for them to be able to say this is how i'll prevent in as much as i'm engaging in these activities so conversations need to be had as parents we need to take up our role allow me to say this let's not mitigate it to just the school and the church because i know a lot of programs are happening currently courtesy of the church and also at school we have the life skills programs that has been ongoing However, you're supposed to be the fundamental source of information to your children. So as parents, we need to step up. As a society, it doesn't mean that you're only a parent to your biological children. We are Africans. So in Africa, we used to say your uncle could also be your parent. So as a society, are we taking up our roles as the older generation to be able to have these conversations with the younger generation. And this is where I call for us to be able to be, uh, to, look, to focus a bit more and look at with these holidays. Because also let me put it across. These holidays, our children are coming home with a lot of stress. They've been in school for four terms. They went to school with the effects, you know, with the trauma effects of COVID. So this is when they get to, 
<sighs> relax. How will they re relax? If we are not intentional about these holidays, this is where they end up engaging in sexual behavior. And like we are saying, these are condom shortage. What will happen at the end of the holidays? Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, and uh, the because uh, one of the questions we are considering, uh, Joshua, yeah. is uh, how do you reach them? Where do we reach Gen Z? Uh, unlike ourselves who, you know, KBC would shut down at a certain point in the night and come on at a certain time and <laughs> we would all be there glued, we are watching news at 7 and 9, that's not the case. Now, uh, uh, I heard that you have uh, Maisha Youth. Youth. Yes. How is that working? Okay, great. Um, I, I think for this generation, uh, Zen, we, we need to reach them differently. Mm. Uh, number one, we know majority of them are in school. And therefore, the first thing that we are doing is to work with the Ministry uh, of Education to ensure that uh, there is introduction of um, uh, sexual education or family education or health education within the curriculum. That has been done. The second thing that uh, we are doing is that also we have Maisha youth and this takes care of them that are out of school the youth out of school and therefore in every county we have we call them a Ma a Maisha youth chapter and this is where they come together they dialogue using a language that they can be able to understand so they reach to the others and that is something that's not going the other thing is that uh, you've heard that uh, we have a country a countrywide um, uh, campaign and we are calling it triple threat. Mm. Triple threat is to address the three threats that we've referenced. One, there is uh, issues of uh, adolescent pregnancies. And we are saying that we've also seen uh, adolescents aged 10 to 14 years still presenting in health facilities when they are pregnant. Now, thinking of 10 to 14, that's a child who should be in school and enjoying childhood. That's the kind of situation that we have. Um, number two, we are talking of the issues of sexual and gender-based violence. We can't be able to rule out issues of sexual violence, whereby you have the young people, uh, uh, be, uh, their rights being contravened in terms of rape and other exposures that uh, really are called for. And uh, the last thing is the issue of new HIV infections. And I would say that as we've said, this is one uh, generation that we are seeing the number of new infections going up. So as we try to find out where the, the increase in new infections are coming from, is actually from young people. They are contributing quite a lot. And therefore in the discussion we can't rule them out, but also uh, through uh, NSDCC uh, we have a campaign for all 47 counties. Right now we've reached 47 counties and what are we doing? We are working with, um, with, with the leaders within each county, community leaders, government leaders, county leaders. We bring them together, we dialogue, and then commit as a county how do we reach out and protect uh, the young people. So that is something that is ongoing because we know, as it has been said, this is also the, uh, the, t um, the group that will say Nikon ID. And these days, it means Nikon ID, it means then I can do almost everything. But the call is, are these to the young people? The truth is, you may have ID, or you're almost having an ID, but you have responsibility to protect yourself and ensure that whatever decision that you make, you know it has consequence, and therefore you may blame the teacher, you may blame the parent, you may blame other people but by the end of the day I would say if you are a young person and you get infected this is what it means you will be able to take ARVs for the rest of your life the good thing is ARVs are there to ensure that we are able to lead a normal and productive life but it means that we have to take those medicines the rest of our lives unless the science uh, sci the science changes but where we are right now we need for life we right. need to every time consider that decision that we are making and ask ourselves how much are we protected right. thank you
uh, Dr. Kinyanjui, I'll, I'll come to you, but first I wanted Dr. Amulwa to respond on the question of uh, taxes. And, and the question I'll come back uh, to you with is this. We, I don't know, I don't want to call us a pretend conservative society because we tend to do certain things behind closed doors, but in public uh, we refuse to address these subjects. And, and the reason I ask this is uh, when we're told we have 10 to 14 year olds presenting uh, with pregnancy in healthcare facilities, it means from as early as nine. Yeah. They've been engaging in sexual activity. There was a proposal to provide condoms in schools. And also, when we're talking about uh, uh, sex, sex and reproductive health uh, being incorporated into the syllabus, how really what... My question is, what, uh, are we really addressing the questions that this generation uh -huh. has? Yes. Or are we, uh, uh, are we teaching them from a pulpit uh, sort of uh, position. My question would be, are you teaching them from 1980 or are you teaching them from 2022 year? Uh -huh. yes. yes. So that, that is uh, my question, Dr. Kinyaji. But before uh, you respond uh, to that, so basically my question is, this, should we change our approach? Should we consider, right. for example, if they're having sex from as early as nine, uh, by making condoms available to them freely, are we encouraging them? Uh, to engage in sexual activity or are we simply uh, facing the reality of the times? Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing Joshua is like, thank God she didn't ask me that question. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dr. Mulwa, the question of, of taxes, uh, the gentlemen here have made the case that prevention is better than cure. They've talked about, uh, you, I think you, you all talked about a gap of 10 billion shillings uh, that, and air visa loan per year could cost, you talked about Dr. Kinyandri, uh, for a person buying a condom? Okay. Buy, buying a condom will be like a thousand per year, uh -huh. the government wants to invest, versus uh, spending uh, upwards of 32,000 per year on ARV treatment. Per person? Per person. Yes. And this is a lifetime. Okay, so why not prevent these cases to begin with uh, by uh, doing away with prohibitive taxes, uh, for instance? Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I think... Uh, uh, City idea, I don't think with, uh, anyone, anyone of us is competent to talk about the issues of taxation. Uh, uh, but uh, I think as a government, we have tried uh, and, and we have been engaging our partners to seek for tax exemption for donations. Uh, the, the, the thing that uh, uh, is, the, and this is in the purview of the National Treasury, it's not something that the Ministry of Health can do. Uh, we propose uh, and and we have been push pushing for for shift so that uh, uh, donations for condoms and other uh, medical commodities are exempt from taxes of course uh, uh, is in a state of economy where uh, as much uh, the, the, the national treasury business is to collect as much tax taxes we are the same people who, are, who go to treasury and ask for more resources and they will tell us where will we get the resources if you are the one asking us not to collect taxes uh, for some of the commodities. But uh, I think this is a conversation because we have done it uh, with a, a global fund, done it with the, uh, the US government uh, financing, and we can do it with other partners where first there is a forehand declaration of such donations so that we know in the coming year, uh, AHF, which is the organization that Kenyaji works for, is going to deliver or is going to donate uh, 20 million uh, condoms worth this value, and uh, they are so declared. So when, when, when this is done, and I think uh, we have been having this uh, conversation uh, with, 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 with our partners so that we can be able to ensure that uh, we can work with Treasury and have this uh, get done. Uh, of course, it's the same thing for uh, for the commodity have been in the news. Uh, Ministry of Health, I think, some vaccines expiring, having stayed in the in the, in the port for three years, uh, worth billions of shillings. We have had family planning commodities as well, and it it it, it all begins before uh, these commodities leave their country of manufacture to the country to to, to Kenya. First, we, they must be in the master role uh, of uh, tax-exempt commodities, so they, they are declared before they are shipped. Because when they come at the port, and now is when you are supposed to 
be clear that we have these commodities and they need tax exemption, it becomes completely, uh, extremely difficult for us. But when there is beforehand uh, or prior declaration and tax exemption is sought before they are actually imported, I think it is always possible. And we have done that before. And uh, just weigh in on our conversation that uh, you are having, we are having on the issue of the young people. I think the Ministry of Health uh, recognizes uh, the, the, the gaps in sexual uh, education that exists in the country. I think it is based on that that the Ministry of Health developed the teenage guidelines, which is a guideline that can be used by caregivers, by adolescents themselves, by uh, community leaders to understand the issues of uh, adolescents and young people. And it's an holistic approach, uh, making the right relationships, sexual education, uh, body hygiene, healthy living, physical education, all these things are part of that. Uh, we also recognize as we are developing that, that we do not, our parents today uh, do not actually understand how to deal with adolescents and young people because they are exposed to too many information from so many sources and therefore the parents sometimes even don't know what to do. We are actually in the in the course of developing a parenting guideline because we have realized we have to plug in the gap and we are coming up with a parenting guideline that parents of young people of adolescents can have a doc that they can uh, refer to because sometimes i am an, an, a father to to teenagers sometimes i honestly even as a doctor i honestly do not know what to tell them so but uh, if we have a, 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 doc, a, a document that can guide parents and teenagers have a document that can guide them we believe that will will, will go a long way in uh, addressing this. the issue of uh, providing uh, condoms and family planning commodities to young people uh, i think th there is a lot of push and i feel it uh, where i sit in the ministry that uh, we we liberalize but uh, a 10 year old is not another so they are not able to make conscious decisions on their own and that's why every time we talk about uh, reproductive health and sexual education we talk about age appropriate giving a child a condom does not solve a uh, problem it actually uh, it actually gives brings more problems to society than than, than giving them an education that is appropriate for their age Tell them this is what is happening to your body. You need to delay sexual debut for reasons. You need to, if you give them that education, you empower them rather than give them the family plannings. And you know, there are schools of thought that uh, that, 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 that think uh, providing them with this is helpful, but it will be killing the society, it will be uh, sexualizing uh, our children and our, our society, which, which is not the approach we want. And studies have shown up to the age of uh, 16, uh, you, children are unable to make uh, decisions, uh, mature decisions of their own. In fact, up to the age of 24 is when you can say a human being can make conscious decisions uh, for themselves. So I think this is a debate that, uh, of course, has been ongoing. And in the school health uh, policy that we are developing and adolescent health policy that we are developing, we are addressing some of these things so that we don't sexualize. We don't sexualize our young people. We give them what is appropriate for them. I think right. I, I, I felt it on that. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you, Dr. Amulwa. And I'll invite you now, because I've seen Winnie Lubembe walk in, so she's, she's signaling me that you, your time is out. Uh, so the, the last word from, from uh, my panel in studio, Dr. Kinyanjui. Now, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but Olive. on the question of commodities, in, uh, family planning and condoms, uh, condoms are, anyway, uh, but uh, on that, a guardian can't purchase that for, I mean, for a young person, because you're saying, Dr. Mulu is saying up to the age of 24, uh, maybe their brains are not fully formed. Uh, a guardian can make that decision on behalf of the child? I'd like to look at it uh, from a wider perspective. Uh -huh. And uh, I want to agree completely with Dr. Mulu about mm -hmm. uh, the issue of uh, comprehensive sexual education in school as an important, and programs even for young, for parents as they prepare, they, the, the, the guideline will not be A to Z, mm -hmm. but it will be a general direction, guiding people, like giving them steps on what to talk about and the how. Because most of the time we know what needs to be said, it's the how, how to approach it. That is important. 
So for AHF, what we have done is that we need to get mentorship programs for girls, for boys. A lot of the time, the society has neglected the boys. For AHF, we have a program called Girls Act. It's a mentorship program for girls between the ages of uh, 10 up to all the way to 18, and we group them in groups and meet with them monthly, especially in school, under the guidance of the teachers and the Ministry of Education, and we anchor it under men uh, uh, menstrual hygiene as our basis for where we start the conversation. For boys, we have a, a project called Boys to Men. The boys, half the boys now, are coming up from families that are single parent family, and they need a little bit more than a family where there are two, fam there are two parents, because developmentally, uh, Esther will tell you that there is a gap, and they need a, either a mother figure or a father figure to okay. hold their hands to grow and be stable going forward. The next thing I wanted to say about um, providing family planning uh, methods to children, for me is a no-no. Why? They are not, besides mentally being able to handle it, it will also affect their physical biology. They have not developed enough okay. to be able to uh, engage in that. Mode. What we do, it may even affect the kind of quality of people we are going to have in the future. All right. The hormones will interfere with their de normal development. All right. Your last we need them to give them Esther? a purpose in life. All right. Yes. Your, your last word, Esther. Thank you. Uh, my last Thank word you, Dr. Lee. Sorry for <laughs> rushing you. Uh, in Tafukuza studio. Yes. <laughs> I think my last word would be let's, let's keep having these conversations and let's be very candid and honest, honest about them because our children know a lot. It's just that we've not given them a platform to share what they know we normalize it and then we're able to psychoeducate them and give them the right information for them to be able to make appropriate, um, age appropriate decisions. Like everyone has said, our children are not ready for contraceptives and condoms because mentally and physically their bodies are not ready. So we need to go back to the fundamentals and I cannot overemphasize, let's have conversations. All right, your last word. Okay, thank you. Just to say that, um one, we know that uh, treatment works. We have 1.2 million on treatment. There is around 250,000 who are not on treatment, meaning they don't know their status. And therefore, we need to ensure that we find them, identify them, and start them on treatment. The other thing is that uh, we know uh, that uh, because of that, being not on treatment means they are transmitting HIV, and therefore there is need for us to protect whether it's the young people or everybody, we need to ensure that we protect ourselves. Finally, just uh, on the young people, it's just to say that uh, we have two months holiday for them that are in school, uh, primary, secondary, and, uh, and the tertiary institutions. I think we need to take that responsibility and ensure that um, we are able to separate well during these holidays and protect ourselves. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Kitonga. Uh, Celine, yes. you have to say something about the children who are living in the world? Yes. I would say that my mother is the one who is living in the world. You know, you can be the one who is living in the world. So, when you have to say something about it, you can say something about it. You can say something about it. So, what you can say is that you have to say something so ndio itafanya tu akitoka hapa hiyo anapata hii ugonjwa nje naona so tusikwe wakali wa mama then ukiwa positive meza dawa hizi dawa ni bure meza dawa sasa hii ukiwa mgonjwa hakuna mtu anaweza jua labda ukijiachilia utaki kumeza hiyo dawa ndio mtu atajua kama uko uko na nini uko mgonjwa so okay. umeze dawa wa mama tusikwe wakali kwa watoto oh, yeah. yes thank you very much yes. Celine Akinyi from positive young women's Voices. Asante sana kuwa hapa leo asubuhi. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Sam Kinyanjui, who is from AHF AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, and we also want to thank Joshua Gitonga from the NSDCC. He is uh, the Head of Monitoring and Evaluation National Syndemic, uh, Direct, uh, Syndemic Disease Control Council. Cancer. And it will take some getting used to. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank <laughs> Esther. Uh, Esther, who is from Kipepeo. Uh, wellness. Uh, she's a counseling psychologist, Estambao, and uh, also all the way, coming all the way from South Africa, virtually, uh, Dr. 
Andrew Mulwa, thank you very much. Have yourself a good morning. Winnie Lubembe coming up next with Your World.